your website. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Grace Wozniak, the current president of the Upper Spaniel Health Foundation. And what we, who we have today, uh, Dr. Uh, Steve Friedenberg, who is a clinical vet and researcher up in at University of Minnesota. And he's going to talk today very casually, so ask questions <laughs> um, about IMHA in dogs and then spaniel and slumbers. Thank you. So we're going to turn this on. You all hear me? Yeah, so thanks for the thanks for having me here, Grace. And thank you for the introduction. Um, again, just to kind of introduce myself, I'm, I'm Steve Greenberg. I am a um, clinical veterinarian at the University of Minnesota. I spent about like 10 or 12 years in here on the and I am board certified in emergency and critical care medicine. And um, on top of that, I have a PhD in genetics and also do a lot of research in technology. And I'm particularly interested in autoimmune diseases in dogs. And I kind of came to become interested in IMHA in particular because as a criticalist, we see a lot of patients with IMHA dog coming to the ER, but then as we'll talk about in the lecture today, animal dog with IMHA tends to get really sick. Um, and so they wind up in the ICU and sort of have to take care of them there. And so it's a clinical interest of mine, but then it's also a pretty complicated disease as a geneticist. So it sort of sparked my interest. And so, you know, like, like Rick said, I, I'd like this to be, since there's a very pretty small group, just raise, if, you have, if there's something I say that doesn't make sense, just have like a question, raise your hand, let's sort of address it as we're going through. And we'll try to get done in like an, an hour or so, but if people have any questions, uh, yeah, so that's sure. yeah, that sure makes sense. Well, any questions before I get started? So, um, okay, so what are we going to talk about today? So, I'm going to talk basically two things. So first of all, sorry, I'm sorry, I forgot my t-shirt. So I was like teaching for the past couple days, and I just like left it in my office. We'll talk a little bit about the disease background and mostly how to treat IMHA, where it comes from, and then I'll talk a little bit about my research toward the end of the presentation. Okay. And so over here. Um, so um, when we talk about the disease background, the things I'm going to talk about is first we'll talk a little bit about the pathology of IMHA like how does it happen in the dog to the best of our understanding. We'll talk a little bit about the clinical presentation. So what does a dog with an IMHA look like when you see it when they go to the veterinarian? Um, how do we actually diagnose IMHA? So sometimes um, IMHA is misdiagnosed. There's a lot of things that prevent IMHA. So I'll talk to you guys about how veterinarians think about diagnosing IMHA and then finally how we treat the disease. So that's what we'll talk about um, as far as the disease background. And so I wanted to just sort of start off by dissecting what the disease is because I think it's a little bit of a mouthful and needed analytic data. Um, in that in the abbreviated is IMHA, so almost no one is likely to say those words in the clinic. And so let's sort of just talk a little bit about what it means here, and then we'll get into some more of the specifics um, as we go through the presentation. So the first kind of word here is, is immune disease, right? So we all have an immune system. The immune system is designed in our body to fight off pathogens, whatever else we might encounter on a day to day basis. But as, as I'm sure all of you know, the immune system can also go haywire, right? And in immune mediated diseases, instead of the body attacking a foreign organism, bacteria, a virus, COVID, right, whatever it should be, it starts to attack itself. So these diseases, where they're immune mediated, means the body is attacking itself. So the, the second word in the disease is it's hemolytic. And so what is the word hemolytic? Mean? So we all have these cells in our body. They're called red blood cells, right? It's the reason why when we get a blood draw, you it's red. And there are cells floating around in that make up probably about like 50% of the mass of a drop of blood. It's made up of red blood cells. And in IMHA, what happens is these blood cells become hemolytic. So you have a red blood cell, sort of, you know, I'll show you a picture of it in just a second, it's like a disc. But as the red blood cell gets destroyed, it kind of ruptures. And the doctor term for that is hemolysis. So it's sort of the breakdown of a red blood cell. So you have an immune disease that leads to the breakage of red blood cells. And then the last term in the disease is anemia. And so anemia is a term for too few red blood cells in the body. There's lots of different causes for anemia, like a common cause that you can think of in people. You may have heard, oh, someone has like iron deficiency anemia, right? They don't have, have enough iron in their body. Sometimes this happens like you know, after pregnancy and people, things like that. So too few red blood cells. So we have a disease that's 
mediated by the immune system where the red blood cells are getting destroyed. And the end result is that you can have two new red blood cells floating around the body. Does that kind of make sense? And if I, if I mentioned, like, you know, normally, if you were to take a drop of blood, about half of it is composed of red blood cells. Sometimes when you have a dog with IMHA, it goes down to as low as like 10% or 9% of that blood volume is composed of red blood cells. And that's just way too few sort of carry around important things like oxygen to carry oxygen to tissue to get rid of waste products. All of those things that the red blood cells do that are really I, show, I told you guys I was going to show like just a little cartoon. So, right, this is a normal red blood cell. It's a disc. It sort of, you look at it, it has this sort of um, center in the middle that's a little bit concave. But if you have, when you have hemolysis, that red, cell, red blood cell gets broken down, and as you can see on the right, and it, it breaks up and sort of spills its content. So, that's essentially what's going on. So, this is the same example. Yeah, it's a great question. So, in, in, so you, another term for IMHA is autoimmune hemolytic anemia. You might hear it referred to as AIHA. Um, interestingly, that's really the term that's more commonly used in human medicine for the exact same things. And so in veterinary medicine, we call it immune-mediated hemolytic anemia. In human medicine, it's called autoimmune hemolytic anemia. It's effectively the exact same disease. Um, so some of you may have heard it. You know someone who has it. I work in that. Oh, you work in that. Oh, yeah, so same, same as this one. But is there a question? Or a okay, so let's just start off with some quick facts about IMHA and some of these things I've said already. So IMHA is a disease where the body attacks its own red blood cells and destroys them. Um, and we sort of talked a little bit about that already. Already, it's a treatable disease. So if your dog gets IMHA, there are things we can do but it also has a pretty high mortality rate. And I'll talk a little bit about that mortality rate as we get on, but if you look at the literature, somewhere between 25 and 70% of dogs that get the disease die. And I think that mortality rate has come down or come down over the years. So it depends upon what reference you read and how dogs are treated, but it's a pretty high mortality rate. Even if you have 25% of dogs dying from the disease, you know, not great, one out of every four dogs. Yeah, it's, it's a good question, right? So that, that's one of the things that sort of drives the differences that we see. Um, you know, I, I think most of the mortality that we see in IMHA tends to happen either within the hospital or within the first couple of months after they get the disease. Once on the cat, the first couple of months, they tend to be okay for at, like they relapse and kind of get that and have a sort of a but usually dogs will die soon. And to some extent, like some of the reasons why dog dies because it's also an expensive disease to treat. And a lot of times people kind of run out of money to treat it. You can think of repeated blood cell trans red blood cell transfusion. We'll talk about it to the hospital. Kind of there are some more emerging advanced therapies that you consider. They're all, they're all very expensive. And so that is also a right. but, but it is it is does have a high mortality rate. From, from a genetic perspective, and this is sort of what, uh, what I'm interested in, it, it's what we call a complex disease. So um, what that means is that there's not, to, to the best of our knowledge, right, and to the, our best guess, there's not going to be like a single gene where we say like, oh, a mutation in this gene is what causes IMHA in some respects. And, and so I, I think that's a way, the way that a lot of people in the dog community sort of think of genetic diseases, and I think if we as geneticists have historically studied those kind of simpler diseases, like have a mutation, it's recessive, it's dominant, it's excellent. Some of these may be things that you guys have heard of. When we talk about a complex trait, what that typically means is it is a polygenic trait, meaning there's going to be multiple genes that are sort of lead to the development of the disease. It also probably means that shouldn't think about the disease, even if we understood all the mutations, as like you have the mutations, you get the disease. It's like you have three of the five mutations that are associated with this disease, and therefore you have a 60% risk of getting the disease. Not like you're definitely going to get it, but you have a higher risk of developing the disease than if you had one of the five mutations. And even if you had five of the five mutations, you might only have an 80% chance of getting the disease because one of the hallmarks of a complex trait 
is that there's something in the environment besides the genetic predisposition that actually leads to the disease. And what that is can be a, a number of different things. We'll sort of talk about that as we go through the presentation, but it's definitely a disease with a genetic basis, but it's not a wholly genetic disease. And that's what one of the things that makes it challenging, but also like frustrating, right? Because you sort of can't necessarily pluck it out of the gene super easily. There's so many genes. Does that make sense? And um, the last thing which I just want to say, and this is kind of like why I'm here, what we were just talking about, maybe going to some of the big spaniel show in Tennessee, is that IHA is really common in, in spaniel breeds. And you know, when they teach us in vet school, it's like the poster child spaniel breed is the cocker spaniel. And probably the reason why they teach us the cocker spaniel is because it's a really popular spaniel breed. Um, and the two breeds, really, the spaniel breeds of the insight the most, I'll have some statistics on this, are cocker spaniels and springer spaniels, again, just because they're probably the most common spaniel breed. But for sure, it, it's anecdotally, it, it's a common enough disease in cucumber spaniels, and sort of that's one reason why I'm here to talk about Questions about anything I've said so far? Okay, so let's sort of talk a little bit about like what happens to the body. So I've kind of showed you this picture before. So this little cartoon here on the left, that's a red blood cell. There are these discs, they flow around the body, they carry oxygen to your tissues, they take away waste products, bring it back to the lungs, they help maintain uh, acid base out of the body, they have a whole bunch of functions, really critical. So in, in immune to hemolytic anemia, what happens is that these red blood cells get coated with antibodies. And so antibodies are things that the immune system makes normally to fight disease. And for whatever reason, we don't really understand how you go from red blood cell to red blood cell coated with antibodies. We don't understand all of those immunologic mechanisms. But for whatever reason, those red blood cells get coated with antibodies. And like anything in the body, when it gets coated by antibodies, the immune system thinks, oh, that's something I should kill, and that's something that I should get. And so when the red blood cells get coated with antibodies, your red blood cell then circulates throughout the body, and one of the organs that it goes to is the spleen. It also goes to the liver. And in the spleen and the liver, we have these cells that I've, I've shown up here on the right, they're called macrophages. And these are cells that like eat up things. They have not many different functions in the body, but they eat up things that sort of normally shouldn't be there. And so they see these red blood cells, that are coated with these antibodies, they say, ah, I'm going to sort of chop that up and destroy it because that's what I do as part of my normal system. And so they kind of get rid of these red blood cells, and that's how you become anemic, right? Because the body is eating the red blood cells that is coated with it. So that, that's kind of what happens. From a, you know, if you think of the immune mechanism of IHA, we understand a lot more about what happens between here and here. So how the red blood cells and get taken off by the macrophages, we understand that. But all of these kind of parts of it, which are a little bit more complicated immune mechanisms, they're things that do have to do with genetics, we understand that a lot less in the researches. So that's kind of what happens. Okay. So when we think about IMHA in dogs, there's two different types of IMHA. And the first type of IMHA that we have is something called IMHA, and that's when dogs get the disease, and there's really absolutely no reason why you think it happen. So essentially, you wake up one morning and you have a sick dog, and there's nothing you did, there's nothing the dog did, there's nothing that you're out, it just wakes up with the disease. All of a sudden, it's sick. And, there, and so this is a disease called primary, sometimes doctors will call it idiopathic, it's sort of a term that doctors use when they actually don't understand why something happens, is the term is called idiopathic. Um, in, in veterinary medicine, we think that these primary cases are about 70 to 80 percent of them. And probably a good um, part of the reason why we have these idiopathic cases is because of genetics. And that's probably why we see a concrete in certain breeds, is because there is an underlying genetic predisposition to disease. But we just don't really understand. And I said here, genetics are probably a major factor in this. Um, and then sometimes it can sort of take on this return in case you ever hear a doctor call something called non associative IMHA. That just means it's not associated with any number of reasons. So, another term is called non associated, but more commonly, when it would be the term. Um, another sort of type of IMHA is, is something called secondary IMHA. 
And that's something where we clearly can identify a trigger for these diseases. Just getting back, right? We sort of talked about these autoimmune diseases, not solely genetic. There's probably some kind of a trigger. And so, what can we identify a factor associated with disease onset? Oftentimes, we see IMHA associated with cancer. So, for example, the, an average age of a dog to get IMHA is probably middle age. If you see it in an older dog, like a 10, 12, 14 year old dog, your veterinary brain and your brain should immediately be thinking there's something else going on here. This isn't kind of quite fit the normal clinical picture. And a lot of times there's like an underlying tumor or something like that that triggered the disease. You kind of have to go home. Certainly, sometimes like infectious diseases can trigger INHA. Um, there are certain, for example, diseases that in organisms that live inside of red blood cells or on top of red blood cells, certain tick-borne diseases can actually trigger INHA. Um, there's been a number of sort of a bit of research out there looking to see a vaccination. So the standard vaccine that we give for like rabies and parvovirus and things like that can associate can trigger INHA. There's not great conclusive evidence on this, but you know, one thing which is you know factually correct, and I'm, I'm in no way shape or form like an anti-vaccine factor person, but if you look at the human literature cases, there have been lots more reports of INHA since COVID, not only associated with COVID itself, but also associated with COVID vaccination. And so, you know, also things like checkpoint inhibitors, which are like cancer therapies, they're all been associated with cases of like autoimmune malignancy. So there are certainly triggers. We don't really fully understand them in veterinary medicine, but we think the vast majority of these cases are a the of the Okay. And oh, this is also sometimes a genetic thing in secondary, right? Here. And this is sort of now also associated with that. Okay. So let's talk about a typical dog. And I sort of put up here a picture of a cocker spaniel because a cocker spaniel is the typical dog gets IHA in Europe, she's learning about the disease in better in med school. Um, and so there's a strong pre 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 predisposition, right? And there's no literature in particular out there on cumber spaniels because it is a, a smaller breed. But when you look at the risk of getting IHA in a cocker spaniel or a springer spaniel compared to like an average dog in an epidemiologic study, cocker spaniels have like a 12 fold increased risk. Um, Springer spaniels have like a tenfold increased risk. Other breeds that have been studied, Dichon Grisage, Rough Hooded Collies, Finnish Spixes, but kind of the, the classic ones again are, are the Cockers and Springer Spaniels. Um, it is a disease of middle age in dogs for the most part. We think of an average age dog as around five or six. There's no clear predisposition for either being spayed or neutered or being a male or female. Um, if you look at the human literature, there kind of is a classic predisposition of women to getting autoimmune diseases in general. It's not clear that that really exists in veterinary medicine. It may have to do with the fact that most dogs that we evaluate are spayed or neutered, so that hormonal influence isn't as strong. So you see a lot of conflicting information in the literature out there. But um, it's not, it's no clear uh, sex predisposition. Now, I, I want to sort of show you that this next. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, is it more prevalent in uh, actual, you know, uh, breeds versus mixed breeds, like single breeds? Uh, 100%. Yeah. So, the, like, definitely, if you look at, like, the, the, like, cockers and springers, and what I think, like, an average dog, like, the average dog population plus mixed breed dogs. Right. Okay. Yeah. This is, like, relative to, and mixed breed dogs, I would think. I would say IMHA is much more aware, okay. but it for sure can happen, right? Because mixed breed dogs have the DNA of any predisposed breed, right? So they can definitely, definitely do see it in mixed breed dogs, but less common. Now, this is kind of interesting, and, and this is um, and this is not really nice to sort of, I'll zoom in on this in a second, but this is what I like to call the wheel of genetic relatedness. There's a pretty well known researcher, her name is Elaine Ostrander. She works at the National Institute of Health. Um, every once in a while, she puts out this sort of updated version of this thing called the wheel of genetic relatedness. And in, in scientific terms, it's called a cladogram. And what she does is she uses this genetic data that we get from these sort of fancy things called SNP chips. And using the, just looking at healthy dogs across all the dog world, we can evaluate how related certain breeds are. And so, you can kind of see just looking at from 
perspective here, there's different colors on this wheel. And all of the colors here are sort of re represent kind of like dog families, like sporting breeds or, you know, working breeds and, and, and those kinds of things. Now, interestingly, if you zoom in on this kind of wheel of relatedness, um, and, and you look at kind of the spaniel breeds here, you can see those red dogs, which are kind of over here. I just, I just flipped the diagram. You can see what box it in. The English Cocker Spaniel, the Field Spaniel, the American Cocker Spaniel, the English Springer Spaniels, and the Clumber Spaniels are all very, very highly related genetically. And so when you look at the incidence of IMHA, incidence of IMHA is also like highest within all of these breeds. And so that's one of the reasons why we know that the disease definitely has genetic component, because in all of these breeds, we see a high degree of representation of IMHA because all of the dogs in this lineage that I've kind of boxed in here have some degree of genetic relatedness. For example, much more common from these dogs than you know would be from these dogs to a standard poodle. Does that make sense? So we're going to sort of switch gears and talk a little bit about clinical signs and what we see in, in dogs with the disease. Any questions before I kind of switch over to that? So what do we see in, in dogs with IMHA? So kind of the hallmark when we think of the disease is this anemia, right? Where dogs don't have as many red blood cells as they as they need. And those red blood cells are mentioned are getting like, so they're getting destroyed. So one of the first things that you might notice in a dog is you might with IMHA, you might notice the pale mucus membranes. And so having lots of red blood cells in the bloodstream are one of the reasons why we have pink mucus membranes because we, those red blood cells are flowing through capillaries and the gums that are really near the surface of the body. But when the number of red blood cells gets too low, instead of being a normal red color or sort of a robust pink color, you get the dogs develop these pale signs, right? And it's not specific to IHA. Pale pink mucus membranes can mean a lot of things, but we oftentimes see pale mucus membranes associated with IHA. And the other kind of classic thing that we see in dogs with IMHA are yellow mucus membranes. So some so yellow is, is a is, the yellow is called caused by something called bilirubin. And there's kind of two main sources of bilirubin in the body. One is the liver and the other is red blood cells. So we call this icterus, is also the, the medical term for yellow mucus membranes. And those yellow mucus membranes can typically yellow if you have your liver disease or if your red blood cells can become chemolyzed and some of the pigment, the red blood cells are getting sort of processed by the liver and turning your, your blood yellow. Does that make sense? So those are sort of some of the kind of classic signs you might see if you're wondering, oh, this is my dog in my MHA, sort of look at its gums, you're like, so it looks kind of pale and yellow at the same time. Oftentimes you can also see that yellow tinge in the sclera, which are the whites of the eyes. Um, and that's oftentimes Really consistent with IMHA. So you see those things too. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, other kind of common clinical signs that we see is just like weakness and lethargy. So, you know, dogs just kind of laying there, just want to get up. Um, you can also see them not want to eat. Vomiting is another kind of classic clinical sign that we see in dogs with IMHA. Dogs, tick dogs like to vomit, and it's like no matter what, it's a very non specific sign that it's sort of something. Um, you can think of sometimes dogs with IMHA get a fever, um, and you'll oftentimes see dogs with IMHA have a really fast heart rate. So if you put your finger on their pulse, you normally sort of take the dog's pulse in the groin. Um, you know, you'll you'll sort of you'll, you'll feel it very fast, um, or if you sort of put your hand over their heart, you can sort of feel that their heart is racing. That's oftentimes a common thing that we see with IMHA. You may see them breathing fast, and then if you're a veterinarian, you sort of palpate their liver and their spleen, you'll oftentimes feel those two. So if you sort of notice any of these signs, like so what would a veterinarian do to try to confirm that the dog actually has an MHA? Um, and so there's kind of a number of different tests that a veterinarian is going to run. And so one of the first things that we would do is run something called a complete blood count in a biochemical. Some of you might take your dog to the vet, and the vet's like, oh, you know, I want to do some kind of blood work on your dog. This is sort of the classic thing that's done for just a wellness check or almost any time your dog gets sick. And that would probably be indicated if your vet thinks that there's IMHA. 
Um, and we'll talk about what you might see on those tests in a minute. Um, you can also look on, um, you also want to look at the blood for some evidence that there is an autoimmune disease of this entity. And we'll talk about what that means, but that's certainly something we need to do to confirm an IHA case. You also want to look for evidence that red blood cells are being destroyed, the hemolytic part of the disease. Um, and then there are sometimes some other tests where we try to figure out, okay, can we find a cause for IHA, or is it just one of those primary or idiopathic cases where we don't really understand what's going on? So, what would we look for on a complete blood count? So, um, one of the first things that we're going to look for is anemia, right? So, I mentioned earlier that normally about like 50 percent of drop of blood is red blood cells. Veterinarians classify anemia as any time that drops below 30 percent. Um, sometimes it can be low as 10%, 9% when the case with the disease has become like pretty life threatening. Um, and you know, some people you may have taken your dog to the vet and your vet's like checked that's something called the PCV or PAC cell volume or hematocrit. These are kind of all terms for the same thing of trying to evaluate anemia. So we can look for it to be below 30%. Um, we can oftentimes look on a on a CBC your vet will see something called regeneration. So when your body becomes anemic, there are certain receptors that actually live in your kidneys, and your kidneys release a hormone that tells your bone marrow, oh my God, that dog's anemic, it should be making more red blood cells. And so we can see evidence of younger red blood cells on a CBC which is an indication that the body's like kicked into overdrive to make more red blood cells to try to offset the fact that the body's also destroying those red blood cells. Um, and then oftentimes we see evidence of inflammation. So the breakdown of red blood cells is a very inflammatory process. And so that can sort of inflammation is kind of when you have excessive inflammation in the body, um, it's never a really good thing because it activates the immune system further but you can see evidence of that on the um, When you run a chemistry profile, um, one of the things that we oftentimes see is elevated bilirubin. So bilirubin is a pigment, as I mentioned earlier, that's produced by the liver, but we also see it when red blood cells are broken down. So you know, that's part of the reason why your dog looks yellow. So anytime the bilirubin gets above a certain level, we see those like yellow things that paint. And so that's kind of classic for IMHA. Um, and then we can also see some changes. So that's kind of the picture that you might see on some basic blood work that a veterinarian would run. But all of these things that you might see are only suggestive. They don't necessarily confirm a diagnosis of IHA. And there's some other things that we look for that are more. Any questions about this stuff so far? Okay. Yeah. 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 So usually they're mature red blood cells. So um, red blood cells typically don't get red blood cells are made in the bone marrow, and most of the time they don't actually get released into the bloodstream until they're mature. Um, but it's for the most part, it's a, it's a good question: Is the mature red blood cells are going to get mature? And the average lifespan of red blood cell in the dog is about ninety days, and then they don't get recycled. And it kind of Okay. okay. Anyway, so there's some other things we sort of look for. So I mentioned another sort of hallmark of looking for the disease is we look for evidence that there is not only anemia, not only liver enzymes, we also look for evidence that there's an immune mediated process that's actively going on. And so one of these things that we'll sort of look for on um, when we sort of look at the blood cell is we look for these types of cells that are called spherocytes. And so just sort of taking a look at this picture here on the left, you see these like cells with just these discs that look like they have this area where they're kind of clear or white in the middle. Those are normal red blood cells, but there are a couple of them here. There's one, two, three, four, and I have sort of an arrow pointing to them. Can you see how those cells look like really, really round and they look like a little bit smaller? And so what that is, is they're, they're like little fragments of red blood cells. So I mentioned that there are these cells that live in the liver and the spleen that dump the red blood cells. So sometimes when they kind of take a chunk of the red blood cells, they don't eat it entirely. 
So you can kind of think of it like there's some cookie crumbs left over as the macrophages eat up the red blood cells. And those cooking crumbs kind of form these oddly shaped things called, things called spherocytes that float around in the body as sort of not fully sized red blood cells, but just like fragments of red blood cells. And so seeing those is almost like cathodonic for a dog that actually has INHA. So it's one of those things that you, you kind of need to look for to confirm that, yes, this is what my dog has. And, um, now we'll kind of know how to treat it. Um, another thing that some of you have to Kind of a certain percentage of those, or do you just see two or three? Good question. Yeah, that's a good question. So, clinical pathologists will grade how many spherocytes that they see. It's a little bit of a um, clinical impression. Like, you typically grade them on a scale of one to four. You can see a few spherocytes with like a number of different diseases, but once they get to be sufficiently prevalent, then that's almost specifically diagnostic for IHA. But it's, there's no like number I can give you. It's kind of the perception of the kind of very specialized in looking at blood cells. But there are other things we can do besides spherocytes. And one of those other things is something called a saline dispersion test. And this is actually a, a, a pretty kind of interesting thing to look at from someone who just wants to understand more about IMHA. So if you sort of look at this, um, this picture here on the right. So what this is, is this is just looking grossly at a drop of blood and a drop of saline mixed together on the slide. And can you kind of see how they're all those like clumps of red blood cells together? So that's not, if you were to do that in healthy dog's blood, it would just sort of appear like a dilute bit of blood normally, but you wouldn't see those clumps. And those clumps are actually what's going on in the body of a dog with IMHA. Those red blood cells are actually clumping together We'll talk about that in, in a, little, a little bit later. And so that's abnormal. And the reason that clumping happens is because you have autoantibodies coating the red blood cells, and the autoantibodies like to link up together and form these clusters. And so that's also an evidence of one. Um, there's another type of cell that we sometimes see. So this is something you look at under a microscope. They're called these ghost cells. So can you see those things that I pointed arrows to? They're like kind of really empty. They look like a red blood cell, but it's just a, a ghost of it. It's really just the outer shell of it. That's also evidence of um, the autoimmune process. Um, and then the other thing, other things we look for is evidence of red blood cell lysis. So I showed you this picture here of icterus before. That's the pigment of icterus comes from the breakdown of products released in the red blood cell. Sometimes you can actually saw, see that pigment appear in the urine of dogs. So, you know, most of the time, I'm sure everyone here has had a dog that's had like blood and urine. Most of the time it's associated with a urinary tract infection. There's nothing to kind of get freaked out about. But if you have sort of pigmented urine, blood and urine, along with all of these other signs that we're talking about, like yellow mucous membranes, your dog's pale, your dog's lethargic, that could actually mean something kind of much, much more serious that we should be um, And a couple of other diagnostic tests that we often find run on patients with IMHA. I mentioned that IMHA can be associated with other diseases like tick borne illnesses, fungal infections. So your veterinarian may sort of want to think about things like performing some of these diagnostic tests. Um, oftentimes, if you think the disease is secondary to things like cancer. Your veterinarian might recommend things like a chest x-ray to look for evidence of cancer or an abdominal ultrasound, also really to look for abnormalities within the organism, within the abdomen, excuse me. Um, your veterinarian may rarely like consider doing something called bone marrow cytology, which is you put a needle directly into the center of the bone and look for the cells that are sort of the source of other cells in the body to see if something is wrong and with that. Um, and then also just getting like a thorough review of things that are done. So that's kind of the typical workup for dogs with IMHA. You can get most of what you need from a thorough, complete blood count and a biochemistry profile, but there are other certain things that you kind of need to do to confirm that it's IMHA. So things like looking at yeah, sort of a saline dispersion test, um, looking for evidence of ghost cells, those spherocytes. There's another test that's kind of rarely done. It's called Coombs test. Um, sometimes they're going to send off that test as well, but um, I just didn't, didn't want to talk about it here. But that's the typical diagnostic plan. 
You had mentioned that this is given to a treatment is expensive. Uh, for sure. Are the tests also expensive? So the tests, you know, so I think once you get into things like an abdominal ultrasound, so when you know in a specialty clinic these days, an abdominal ultrasound you can run about eight hundred dollars, maybe a little bit more if your dog needs to be sedated for it. Because that requires extra monitoring, drugs, and things like that. In basic workup, like CBC, capture barbell, that is I mean, that in and of itself these days is probably four to five hundred dollars, you know, and then you're sort of tacked on needing some of these other tests. And then if your dog is sick enough that it requires hospitalization and transfusion, I, I mean, just to kind of give you like a ballpark, when we quote, if we a dog come in through an emergency room visit that we think is likely to have a J, need to be hospitalized for a couple of days, potentially going to need blood transfusion, we're probably quoting like four to $5,000 to get started. Um, and that's not necessarily with a great prognosis, right? You don't know that your dog is going to be like walking out of the hospital alive with that. I think that's that. Yeah. Yeah. That's 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 roughly. So that that's oftentimes what happens in, in this disease. So it's you know it's not a great disease for sure. Question. Do do joint taps also in the knees if you've got swelling? It's rare for us to do joint taps in a dog in a dog with IBJ. Um, yeah, like I, like I think most of the time when we do joint tests, the dog has like an unexplained fever and also swollen joints that we're gonna pay for a, a source of another big fever, but not not. Good questions. Thank you guys. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about therapy for MHA. So there's a couple of mainstays of treatment that your veterinary would is gonna be gonna sort of talk to you about, um, and so. Here are the things that your veterinarian is going to want to do. So number one is to suppress the immune system, right? So you know, I showed you those pictures of the red blood cells including antibodies, and that's because your immune system is kind of gone haywire and doing things that it really should do. So kind of the standard therapy, and this is both for humans, for dogs, is to kind of shut down the immune system by suppressing it. And you can imagine this is sort of not without consequences, right? Your immune system is there to kind of do things like fight off infections and you suppress the immune system for too long and you become predisposed to other infections, right? You know, so it, it's not sort of necessarily a benign thing to kind of shut off your immune system. But in this case, when the immune system is going haywire, that's kind of the number one thing to do. And so the, the second thing to do, and we'll talk a little bit about this, is prevention of blood clots. So one thing that dogs love to do, and, and I think it, it's probably, you know, that plus owner financial resources is maybe the number one and two reasons why dogs don't make it from IMHA is because dogs with IMHA love to perform. Remember I showed you that picture of the um, of the, the saline lubrication test that had those like little clumps of red blood cells on the slide? Well, that's also going on in the body of the dog. And if you get a blood clot, like I don't know if anyone in the room's had a blood clot or knows someone has a blood clot, they can go to places where you really don't want them to go, right? And the number one place where a blood clot can sort of get to where you don't want it to go is the lungs. And so we see that commonly in dogs with IMK, and so that's definitely a big cause of mortality and morbidity. And so in dogs with IMHA, you typically need to do something to try to prevent those blood clots from forming. You know, you hear the term blood bitters, it's a, it's a very generic term, but that's effectively like what we use, but there's lots of different medications for it. Um, the, the third thing is blood transfusions, right? So when dogs become very anemic, they need their pack cell volume gets down to the nine or 10%, they start to get really sick from the disease, like they can't get up, they can't walk, their body can't get oxygen to their tissues. And so we need to give them basically someone else's blood to get them through the process while we're trying to shut down their immune system so the immune system doesn't attack their own body. We can sort of give them an external source of blood, and so that's a blood transfusion. And then we also need to kind of give them some support and care through the process. And then if we do have any underlying diseases, like a tick-borne disease, a fungal infection, cancer, kind of treating that is also like a hallmark to fix the problem because Unless you get rid of the underlying problem, you're never going to be able to So let's just talk a, a little bit about um, some of these, these treatments. So I mentioned that the number one hallmark of, of IMHA is the treatment 
treatment prepping is some sort of immunosuppression, so shutting down the immune system. And there's a number of different drugs that we use in veterinary medicine to try to suppress the immune system. Kind of the, the hallmark drug here, sorry. Uh, there we go. Um, the sort of the number one um, drug that we use to shut down the immune system is a drug called prednisone. Some of you may have been taking prednisone yourself, seen dogs on it, friends who take it, right? So, but, you know, I've never taken it myself, but humans, they can tell that they seem very woozy and sort of all those kinds of things. I think dogs, we oftentimes see they want to eat everything in the world. They become what we call like PPD, so polyuric and polydipsic, meaning they drink all the time. Pee all the time. They can also get these big, like, hot belly type periods and have it on the period of time. So, this is not without consequence, right? A lot of owners really hate the side effect of prednisone, but it is sort of the biggest hammer that we have to shut down the immune system quickly and also cheaply, right? So, prednisone has pretty much been around forever, so it's like a dirt cheap kind of drug. And so, that's the number one drug that we use. Oftentimes, We'll add in a second drug, and a lot of times we'll then use that to taper down the dose of prednisone. The classic drugs that are, I think, most commonly used is a drug called cyclosporin and a drug called mycophenolate. Um, these are drugs that work differently than prednisone. Um, they, they also have side effects. So, for example, dogs who take mycophenolate can get really bad diarrhea. Um, they're also a little bit more expensive. But oftentimes we use these because the side effect profile isn't quite as bad as when they think of prednisone. But for sure, prednisone is, needs to be started and then plus or minus some of these other immune suppressors. They can overlap a little bit. They can. No, sometimes. sometimes so, for, sometimes, for example, dogs won't respond to the prednisone and you need to add on a second or even a third at the same time to shut down the immune system. And sometimes you can never really do a great job in shutting it down. So, it, it's okay to give them both, even though you increase the risks of like secondary infection. So, you know, if you're shutting down the immune system, could your dog get a fungal infection that a normal dog would fight off because it's immune system you're you're shutting it down. So for sure that's um, okay. um so I, I mentioned that another kind of really important thing to do to think about in dogs with age HA are these things called blood clots. So you remember I, I showed you this cartoon earlier of red blood cells here, and then I show you in IMHA, we have these red blood cells coated with antibodies. Well, what happens is that the kind of tails of the antibodies actually really like to bind to each other. And so because they like to bind to each other, they sort of tend to aggregate and create these red blood cell clots that I've shown here on the right. And having clots throughout your bloodstream is a really, really bad thing because those clots get bigger and bigger and bigger, and then, as I said earlier, they go to places where you really don't want them to go. And so, the worst place where they can go is the lungs, and we call it a pulmonary embolus or a pulmonary thrombolysis. You'll hear it called for whatever reason in people, it's called a PE. In veterinary medicine, we call it a PTE, but it's really the same thing. And getting a clot into the blood vessel that the lungs really has really bad implications for your ability to kind of breathe and oxygenate properly. So, we really never like that to happen. And because dogs that have IMHA can develop these blood clots, um, we oftentimes put them on drugs that kind of spin the blood. So some of you may have heard of a drug called Plavix or Clopidogrel. That would be a very common drug that we put dogs with IMHA on. Um, it affects a cell called the platelet. There's also another drug called Anoxaparin, which is a type of a drug called a heparin. Um, that's a drug that's an injectable drug, and depending upon what your veterinarian is more comfortable with, how sick your dog is, um, they decide which of these um, blood clotting drugs to take care of. But it is important to kind of be on them, especially when they're really, really sick. Um, the, the next thing which is, is important in IMHA is blood transfusions. And so not every dog will require a blood transfusion with IMHA. So a lot of times it depends upon that value called the hematocrit. So if a normal dog has 50% of their blood, it's full of red blood cells. Um, you know, a, a dog, once they get to the 10% range or sometimes only 20%, they almost invariably need a blood transfusion. But if a dog doesn't get that severe, they may not need one. Giving a transfusion is expensive and it's also not without complications. So you can imagine that if 
auto antibodies that are floating around the bloodstream, well, they can start to attack the transfused red blood cells as well, and that can sort of add fuel to this inflammatory fire. So we, we tend to try to hold off on giving blood transfusions unless they're absolutely necessary, because sometimes they can make a bad situation even worse, but sometimes you absolutely have to give it for the health of the dog. So it's kind of a fine line and a clinical judgment that your veterinarian will make in terms of like, okay, can we give a transfusion or can you not? And then obviously there's kind of a money. So, you know, I don't know what it's like in different hospitals out there, but typically for one unit of blood, right? And so probably one unit is useful, but for a proper spaniel, they're great gain and it's going to be two or three times it, but you know, we probably quote 800 to a thousand dollars just for one unit of blood. Um, and so it's expensive. Um, and it's also not without complications as well, that oftentimes it's going to require these cases. Um, and what else? And then supportive care, right? So this is a picture of a sick, very sick dog. You can sort of see it's you know, fluid pumps or medication pumps. And so dogs with IMHA oftentimes get really sick and do require intensive care. Not every dog, like some dogs can just you give them a dose of prednisone. They're a little bit sick, you catch it early, you give them some prednisone, and like, they're totally fine. But some dogs get really, really sick and require all of these things, and they could require oxygen therapy, fluid therapy, anti-nausea medication, because we're giving them medications as they, their stomach is set. They, they are not eating, they could require feeding to eat to kind of get them better, um, you know, complications with the secondary infection. So a whole host of things can go on in these cases. Um, and this is sort of oftentimes the point of which dogs to go into intensive care, you're getting these blood transfusions when they have all these complications and require a lot more help. And, and this is also the time, you know, when the owner starts to worry, am I putting my dogs through too much? Am I, can I afford it myself, right? You know, sometimes it, it's not like with veterinarians, you see some of the people will be like, I'm going to raid my own 401k plan, you know, to pay for the dog that has a 20% prognosis. And, you know, it's, it's really a fine, hard line to, to, to walk. And, you know, there's no right or wrong thing to do, but I think, you know, we feel for, for every dog and every situation. And so it, it can get pretty expensive. Are these things insurance? So, yes, so that's a great question. So it's going to say it depends upon your insurance plan. And one thing to just keep in mind with veteran insurance is it's kind of like car insurance and in then you sort of, you have to pay up front and then you submit a claim to get reimbursed afterwards. But for the most part, insurance carriers will pay for this. Now, sometimes they'll pay for like 80% or 90% or 70% depending on the plan and deductibles and all that stuff. But for sure, I think having pet insurance helps with any major veterinary expense, you know, IVA, cancer, for sure. Um, there is like a, I just want to sort of make you aware there is this kind of treatment out there that I think is becoming more common for IHA. This is a treatment called plasma phoresis. It's also like very expensive, and but it's something that what it does is it basically you put a big needle into a dog's vein and you sort of suck out the blood and you run the blood through a cartridge or filter that gets rid of the autoantibody. So remember, we sort of talked about how these autoantibodies are what bind to the red blood cells. And so you kind of get rid of the dog's own plasma and you replace it with another dog's plasma. So you sort of do this exchange of the dog's plasma for someone else's plasma, and that can help tamp down the immune response. It's not like a cure for the disease by any stretch of the imagination. You need to go to a facility that has the capabilities of doing plasma phoresis, but it's one of those things that have sort of become a little bit more prevalent and certainly there's a bunch more literature in the past. And it's certainly something to be done for in medicine. And there's other treatments out there. Um, like, so, you know, one sort of treatment is a single activity. So if the spleen is eating the red blood cells, sometimes people say, well, we should just like take out the entire spleen. That's actually shown to be relatively effective in, in many cases. So it's just a human number. Yeah, certainly. Uh, totally. And so it's sort of interesting. So you are, you're, you're doing surgery on a sick dog, but believe it or not, the spleen is probably one of the easiest things to remove. Um, they're like surgeons can typically do a splenectomy with a device called a lupusure, 
in under five minutes. Um, from, like by the time you like open the door on the screen, it's usually right there. A ligature is this device that like cuts and ligates and like like cuts and sews like at the same time. You kind of like hold up the screen, go like this, and it's out and you close the dog off as quickly as possible. So it you can be done really, really quickly. I I've had dogs that have gone from like anesthesia, splenectomy to recovery in like 14 minutes. Wow. Like, but it, it, you know, you, you, the, your surgeon's not like normally when you open the dog, you're like, yeah, but then you see what's going on there, and you're just like anyway, so they, they can be done, but it's risky for sure if you're taking a really sick dog, putting it under anesthesia or something. Okay, so kind of last thing, I, so, oh, and then we also talk about therapy, right? So if you have an underlying trigger IMHA, say for an deosis, part of one cancer, other diseases, toxin, you know, you kind of create that, that's a picture in the upper right hand corner of a dog with a, a deosis. Can you see those sort of like diamond shaped things inside of the red blood cell? This should be there. This is called by the forms and called pyroplasm. That can trigger Okay, so what about prognosis, right? So um, we can, in about 60 to 70% of dogs with the disease, we'll ultimately be able to taper, if not get rid of the medications, the immunosuppressive medications. About a third of dogs, though, require these medications for the rest of their life. And the only way that you can tell that you tapered or not is to try to taper it. And then you see what happens. Do they get sicker? Do they get better, right? So this could basically be a med a dog that requires some sort of like lifelong medication, and that's probably in about a third of cases. As I mentioned earlier, there's some wide ranging mortality rates out there in literature. If you look between like 26 and 70 percent of cases die. I think it's probably more toward the lower end today with some better treatments that we have, um, people being willing to spend more on their pets, etc. Um, but it, it is sort of a disease with a high level of mortality. And what causes the death in about 30 to 60 percent of cases, it is those blood clots. So when the blood clots go to the lungs, when it's in the brain, that causes some really severe disease. Um, secondary infections, failure to control the autoimmune process, and I think also money, right? People kind of run out of the ability to do the support of the air and treatments, the plasma releases and stuff. So um, that, that's kind of the, the kind of clinical summary. I, I think I'll just do that. I've been like flapping here for like an hour. Like I was going to sort of take a break. And you know, if people want to stay to understand a little bit more about my research, you're welcome to. Otherwise, if you want to just go and then also like totally fine. But um, any questions about the kind of disease background, pathophysiology of the IMHA? Yes. You say it's common skin. It's a good question. Yeah. That's a good it's a great question, and it, it's unfortunately one that nobody can answer. And this is because epidemiology research in veterinary medicine is just not done. The kind of stuff that is done is the study that I mentioned earlier, which is called like a relative risk study. So that's when we say like spaniels are 10 to 12 more, more likely than an average dog to get IMHA, but we don't know well how likely is an average dog to get IMHA. You only know like what it is relative to another breed. So to say that oh one percent, five percent, ten percent of spaniels get this disease, no one really knows the answer. You know, I would guess it's it's under five percent of dogs that are ever going to kind of get this in their lifetime. I mean, you know, you guys are probably honestly like better judges of that than me. You're sort of more in tune with the plumber world, right? And how often hear people talking about this disease, I, I would think if it were like 10, 20 percent of cases, I mean, we would see this like all the time. It's just like not that. But that's so totally, yes. it's, it's our report. That's right. But this club has been on Facebook. And sure. Totally. Yeah, and I, and I think that the thing is, we know that, like, you know, what will happen, and this is like for anything on the internet, you're only going to hear about the sick dogs, you're not going to hear about the healthy dogs, right? It's just like the, the loudest people kind of speak out. And in this case, they have a reason to speak out because their dogs are sick, right? They want people to kind of know about the disease, but, you know, the hundreds of the healthy clumpers are not speaking up, my dog's fine, you know. So um, <laughs> it, you, just, you just don't know, like, it, it's sort of like, it's, it's sort of a biased, it's a biased sample, but, you know, go ahead. Sure. 
me from the ETC. Um, <laughs> and, and it's because this is it's not, nothing against the ETC. It's just that, like, oh, yeah, you know, um, there's only so much money that you don't want to kind of fund this. And so I, I've actually sort of taken uh, taking another strategy, which is to kind of actually try to get this funded at the NIH, which is the National Institute of Health, um, and to try to have them think of the dog as more of a model for studying the disease. So autoimmune hemolytic anemia, AIJ, is actually a really rare disease in people, but it's very, very similar to what we see in dogs. And there's not very good models because the disease is so rare in people to study the genetic underpinnings of the disease, to study the immunology of the disease. And so, you know, you may be familiar, like a lot of researchers study human diseases in like mice, right? It's really common mice models. Um, and I think using dogs as a model for studying human diseases is becoming more and more accepted and more common. And so I'm, I'm actually hoping to write a middle of writing a grant, I should say, to NIH to study this disease across spaniels. And so, what, so the bottom line is like, I, I'm sort of calling the study in like a soft launch mode presently. And so what I really, because I'm not, I don't want to, like, I don't, not like publicizing this super widely because I don't have the money right now to do like a huge sample collection effort, like among grad students and things like that. But hopefully if I can get an edge funding, I will. Um, but if you do know of dogs that either have or have had MHA, feel free to like send me and I will sort of take those samples on sort of like a soft launch kind of basis. And I have the email address here, here INAJ at UMN that is, goes to like a joint email box that people read. Um, the other thing which I, I will sort of throw out there that we are, I am looking for, and, and I realize this is kind of a little bit of a, a broad thing, but if you do hear or you know of a clumper or a spaniel that has INAJ and the owners is planning euthanasia because they can afford it, because the dog is doing really poorly, and it's a little bit of a planned euthanasia, meaning it's not going to euthanize in the next five minutes, but maybe a day or so. Um, I'm trying to get the spleens from these dogs, like right after they're euthanized. Um, and that's the kind of thing where like I would work with the veterinarian who would have to like send them this kit to sort of collect the spleen and send it back to us. But this having spleen from dogs that actively have IMHA can be really invaluable to studying the immunology of this disease. And so, you know, I realize that's kind of not necessarily the thing for everyone. It's, it's a complicated thing to ask owners for organs right after their pet's been put to sleep. But some owners are really interested in that because they want their dog's bodies to go to research to help other people with the same disease. So anyway, that's that's really good. And I can say it without discussing with the board and us voting, but it's something I think we should talk about maybe reimbursing um, owners to do that because obviously that would be an extra cost after, after what these you know owners are going through that maybe we even help help them. Yeah, and then hyper funding. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. Um, what about sample? And so I think so here the couple things with, with the with the DNA sample. And so if you if you know you know they have had IHA and we can sort of prove it, it would definitely, you know, there's medical meaning, there's medical records that I can look at and be like, this dog would meet my study inclusion criteria, right? Which I you know, I'm going to go through right now, then for sure, one thing that I will sort of say that we come across with genetic research and particularly in, in any is that when you're doing genetic discovery, you really need to minimize the relatedness of dogs. So typically, if a dog is related at the grandparent level or the parent level, you really don't want more than one dog in that pedigree. Ideally, they're not related back to the great grandparent level. And sometimes that can be like really hard, right? You know, so just like yeah, totally, exactly. Especially in our breed, that's really, really small. So, like, you know, it's easier, right? I study different seeds called Addison's and Sixth Poodles. It's a little bit easier in Sixth Poodle, but harder in Portuguese water dogs, which is a much, much smaller breed to find dogs that are kind of related to that level. Now, the reason for that is because if you have dogs that are too related, it can muck up all the statistics that you do. 
um, because you end up sort of fixing on things that are related to the relatedness and not to the disease. And so if we have also pedigrees from those dogs, we can be like, those dogs are sort of not related, you know, going back to the level, then, then they become like more and more valuable. So that's certainly something we can discuss. Yeah. Anyway, so I've got a little bit of a long answer to your question. So maybe the examples that I'm going to are, are, are useful. Um, and, you know, I, I would hope we would be able to make as, as much use of them as possible because it, you know, you don't want to choose it for the generation to put into to like the blood samples, but it's, it's a it's a little bit of a broad subject as well. Yeah. And we and we did like I you know I did mention it here like and so Bro helped fund like a very small study where we actually work to collect blood samples from a bunch of plumber spaniels that we actually have. I don't remember the exact number. We genotyped about 18 of them for a very, very small preliminary study. Um, but we do have some already. Okay. Both of the combination. Correct. It, so that, that's, the, that's the one thing I would sort of say is like, ideally, yes, I want it, but I don't want to like roll out a whole, please send me samples because then I wind up with like people asking me to do things that I can't do because I don't have like grad students and the money to sort of pay for the shipping and all that stuff. So I, I kind of need to get the study funded before we can sort of roll that out with like, you know, trumpets and a you know, marching band kind of thing. Um, and, you know, but, but I think when I think of like the soft launch, it's kind of like, if you hear of a dog that has the disease, email me. If you hear of a dog that's going to get euthanized because it has the disease, send me an email and let's see what we can kind of work out. So kind of like on a case by case basis, but eventually the goal is to kind of like roll this out with like sirens blaring. I really, I really, I really, I really appreciate it. No, it's, 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 I think it's, it's like as a researcher, you know, you want to like do everything, but I think you also have to do things in a way that doesn't like, you know, I could say like, oh, let's roll this out. And then I have nobody to actually do the work. And then you're all like, I'm not doing all the things I said. You know what I mean? Like, so it's, it's just, I don't want to set up expectations that I can't, like, can't achieve. That, that makes sense. So I just, when you said you have a basic foundation, correct? Yeah. I don't know if people know how that works, but basically, Homer Spaniel Health Foundation sends money to them to fund studies, but in conjunction with a whole lot of research, our little breed can never raise enough money to do anything on it. Yeah. So we can so fund certain studies. We have to work together. And, and, so, and that's right. And I think some, like AKC has, has two processes. So they have sort of like a general call for grants, which is probably where your money gets to other people. And then they also have a process where like breed clubs, if they want to just fund like something on their own, like AKC will be like the grant or sort of deal with like the annual reports or the that needs to be filed and all that stuff. So kind of like the record keepers of the process. Um, but that's they, they, that it would be just specific groups that they work with. So yeah. So anyway, so thank you guys for coming together. Yeah. Yeah.